Well, this evening what I'd like to do is read just a few verses from Galatians chapter 4. And then we're going to look at how the whole, uh, well, how the whole Godhead, the, the three persons of the Godhead, are involved in the work of salvation. We see it actually in our text in Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Would you please listen carefully as I read this? This is God's word. Paul writes to the church at Galatia, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now remember this morning we saw Jesus was telling Nicodemus that it wasn't enough to believe that Jesus was a great teacher, an expert in the law, that it wasn't enough to believe that he was sent by God and that he was actually the Messiah uh, if he was in, to enter into God's kingdom. Uh, rather, Jesus pointed him in this particular case to the work of the Holy Spirit to the one who sovereignly brings about the new birth because he alone can quicken, he alone can raise you from the dead, he alone can give you the grace that you need in order to enter God's kingdom. We saw this morning his work is absolutely essential. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot please God because apart from the Spirit of God, all you can do is hate him. And one thing I did mention this morning is we can actually hate God and not know that we do. It isn't until you see what it actually is he requires and realize that you must do these things and you see what he is like truly from Scripture. And anyone can love a God of their own making. Anyone can follow a scheme of, of ethics and morals of their own making and think they love God, but in order to follow God's plan, you really do have to love him. But uh, we want to see this evening that when Jesus said this, when he said the work of the Spirit is absolutely essential. He didn't mean to say that the Spirit was the only one who is involved in the work of salvation. The Father has his part to play, the Son has his, and each of the persons of the Godhead uh, has his. Basically, the Bible tells us each of the persons of the Godhead has loved you and has done something toward saving you and bringing you into his kingdom if you belong to them. And of course, the way you can know that is that you have the Spirit, you're walking according to the Spirit, the Spirit of God is fulfilling the law in you. Now in our passage, Paul tells us about the situation that the Jews were in prior to the gospel, that they were under the guardianship of the law, that the law, the moral law and the ceremonial law was basically a tutor or a teacher that God had given to them to show them their sins. The moral law convicts them of sin. Uh, remember how the moral law written on stone can only condemn, it can't give life, but it shows you that you are condemned, not because there's anything wrong with the law, but because of our sins. It shows us we've broken the law and are liable to the judgment or the curse of the law. The ceremonial law was meant to point them to Jesus Christ, to show them that because they couldn't keep the law, they needed someone who would cleanse them from their sins. They needed the Messiah. So that's why God gave them the law in the first place. Now, that's the condition the Jews were under. The Gentiles were also under a kind of tutor. By the way, that would include all of us. Uh, if we weren't raised in a Christian household, if we we're not Jewish and weren't raised according to Jewish tradition under the, the law and so forth, uh, we were in this situation. We were also under a tutor. But it wasn't the written law. It wasn't the ceremonial system that we were under, but rather it was the law that God wrote on our consciences. 
like the written law, it showed us our sins. It showed us what we deserved for our sins. And it also showed us that we needed a Savior. But Paul goes on to tell the Galatians, and by the way, the Galatians were Gentiles, but the reason why there's so much of the Jewish uh, religion that he's expressing in here is because they're under the influence of the Judaizers, who are Jews, who are trying to get them into the ceremonial system. Paul goes on to tell them that um, when it was time, God the Father sent his Son into the world, and the Son willingly came to redeem those who were his, those who would believe in him, so that he might send his Spirit to change their hearts, to work faith and repentance in them, so that he might adopt them into his family, that they might be saved. Now, what I want us to consider this evening is, is this, that if you belong to Jesus Christ, you owe your salvation to each of the three persons of the Godhead. Now, what I'd like us to do this evening is look at three things. First of all, salvation is the plan of the three persons of the Godhead in eternity. That secondly, salvation is the work of the three persons of the triune God of the Trinity in time. And so, you who know the Lord and receive that grace are to love and honor and respect and worship each of the three persons of the Godhead. So first of all, let's consider that salvation is the plan of the three persons of the Godhead in eternity. This is where we get into the decrees of God, into his absolute sovereignty. The redemption of your soul is really a part of God's eternal plan of that which he has purposed to do from all eternity. It's something that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have always wanted to do. You know, sometimes there's some debate going on as to which part of God's plan did he decide to do first, this part, this part, or this part, and they try to work out some kind of a logical order. But we need to realize that the, the Godhead didn't just sit down at some point in eternity and make decisions. Let's create Adam. Let's allow Adam to fall into sin. Then let's save him and some of his children, including you and me, who have been saved by his grace. That plan is something they always knew that they would do. It is the eternal purpose of God. Now, this particular part of their plan where, where they have purpose to, to save us is often called the covenant of redemption. The agreement that they had, that each of them had to do a particular work in the work of salvation. Namely, that the Father would choose uh, whom he would to save. That the son would be willing to submit himself to coming into the world in order to save them by becoming one of us. And that the spirit would submit to the father and the son to apply the work that the son actually did to save them or to save us. Now we see something of this in Ephesians chapter 1. In verses 3 through 6, Paul tells us that the father is the one who did the choosing, and I want you to notice that he did this before he had made anything. He did it before the foundation of the world. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Boy, Paul says a lot in those few lines. But basically what he's saying is this. If you're a believer here this evening, he chose you. That's the reason why you believe. He says that he chose you before the foundation of the world. That is, before he made the world, he chose you in eternity. He tells you here that his choice was not based upon anything that you would be, the kind of person you were, the way you would look, particular gifts you had, or even anything that you would do. But it was based solely on his love. In love, 
he predestined you according to the kind intention of his will. Not what was in you, but what was in him. And he chose you that you might glorify him for this grace that he has shown you in Jesus Christ, this free gift which you didn't earn, which you did not deserve. He chose to make you holy. He chose to make you blameless in his son. Notice he didn't choose you because you would become holy, because you would make yourself holy, because you would choose Jesus Christ and become holy, but he chose you that you might become holy in his son so that he could adopt you into his family and that he might bless you with every spiritual blessing. That's tremendous treasure that God has given to you and me and we do not deserve it. So that was the Father's part in this covenant of redemption. He would choose whom he would save. Now in verses 7 through 8, Paul tells us what Jesus did in time because of this agreement. Now we do have to understand, and we're going to look at a passage that actually talks about you know, what they agreed to prior to, um, to his coming into the world. But what Paul expresses here is based upon that agreement. And again, I'm drawing this part out because it's in the same text in Ephesians chapter 1 in verses 7 through 8. Paul writes this, In him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. In this covenant of redemption, this plan that has eternally existed in the Godhead, the Son of God agreed that he would come into this world as a man, that he would shed his blood, that he would die for you, and all by his grace that he might pay for your sins, that God might forgive you. Jesus basically agreed to come into the world and to do it all, to do everything you needed, really leaving nothing left out. That's why we say that Jesus is the surety or the guarantee of the blessings of the covenant. His work guarantees it all. And all you need to do is trust in him. Now in Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12, we do read about this agreement and the Father's promise to reward his son for his agreeing to do this and carrying it out. Again, a very familiar passage speaking about the servant of the Lord that clearly is the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Again, it's clearly referring to the work of Jesus Christ. It's clearly being prophesied long before he comes into the world. It's based upon that agreement that three persons of the Godhead had eternally what they had purposed to do in their plan. So the Father has his part in choosing. The Son eternally agreed that he was going to come into the world and give his life. And then in verses 13 and 14 of Ephesians 1, we see that work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. He says, in him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Again, all these things done so that we might glorify the triune God for what he has done. But I want you to notice in this particular passage, uh, that this work that the Spirit does that Paul is referring to isn't the work we saw this morning. The, the, the work of baptizing us into the Lord Jesus Christ, that work by which he makes you alive. But this is something that comes after that baptism, something that comes after that new birth. His work of sealing you 
uh, of showing you that you actually belong to him, that you are his child. Paul writes about this in so many different places. In Romans 8, verse 16, for instance, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, that internal witness. That's certainly a part of the Spirit's work and something that he agreed to do in the covenant of redemption. Now, we also saw this morning that there is a work the Spirit does sovereignly in applying Christ to those whom the Father has chosen, a work that makes us alive. Uh, John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now again, why does the Spirit of God do this? It's because that was His part of the plan, uh, that which He agreed to do also eternally in this covenant of redemption. So the Father chose you. The Son agreed to come and do the work that was necessary to save you. And the Spirit came and applied that work to you. Your salvation was the plan of each of the three persons of the triune God in eternity. But salvation is also the work of each of the three persons in time. That's basically what our text told us in Galatians 4 verses 1 through 7. In verse 4, Paul tells us that the Father sent his Son in time. That is, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. He says in verses 4 and 5 that the Son came as a man to redeem us and to make us God's children. In time, he came. God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And he tells us in verse 6 that the Father, and well, basically the Father here, sent the Spirit to apply this work to make us the sons and daughters of God. He says, because you were sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You're no longer a slave as Gentiles. We're no longer slaves to sin, but the Lord has set us free from that. He has made us holy by putting the Holy Spirit into our hearts and giving us a desire to walk in His ways. That shows that we are sons, not just by name, but also by nature. And I want you to notice again, Paul here is not emphasizing the work of the Spirit by which he makes us alive, but rather he is emphasizing the Spirit's testimony that we are sons and daughters. And by the way, I believe that testimony, as I mentioned before, is an internal testimony that convinces us that we are children of God, but he doesn't just tell us that we're children. He doesn't just say, hey, guess what? You're living like the world, but you're really my child. What he says, what he does is he points to the evidence that he is producing in your life, the evidence of that love that you have toward God that expresses itself in the way you live. He points to that evidence and convinces you that you are a child of God. So he doesn't, as it were, bear testimony against the evidence, but he bears testimony with the evidence. Again, that's a very important work of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to know if you are his child, that you do belong to Him. And the Spirit is the one who shows you. But as I've said, He's also the one who in time applies the work of Christ to make you alive. We saw that in the passage I just read where Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. We see it predicted in the Old Testament. The Lord says through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36 verses 26 and 27, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe 
my ordinances. In other words, I'm going to change your disposition towards my law. You didn't want to keep it. You were stiff-necked and rebellious. I told you to circumcise your hearts, and you haven't circumcised your hearts. You haven't changed your heart toward me. So guess what? The Lord says, I'm going to send my spirit, and he's going to change your heart, and he's going to make you walk in my ways. It's exactly what Jesus says also in John 6:63. 6, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So what God desired to do from all eternity, he actually did in time. The Father sent his Son to save you from your sins. The Son came in obedience to his Father. He became a man. He obeyed. He laid down his life to pay for your sins. And the Father sent the Spirit to apply his Son's work to you to make you alive in him so that you would trust Jesus Turn from your sins, be forgiven of your sins, and be clothed with a perfect righteousness. Now, I should also mention this work of sending the Spirit is not the work of the Father alone, even though the passages that we've just read indicate that it is the work of the Father. It is also the work of the Son. Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, verses 7 through 11, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. And Jesus also says in Luke 24, verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So again, the point is that your salvation is as much the work of the triune God in time as it was also a part of his plan or their plan, we'd say, in eternity. Salvation is their plan, salvation is their work. And so, the third point is basically this. <laughs> the love that you have for God is to be expressed toward the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are to love, honor, and respect each of the three persons. The Father loved you so much that he was willing to choose you and to pay the price for your redemption and to adopt you as his children. The Son loved the Father and He loved you so much that He was willing to become one with you, to obey for you, and to die to pay the price of your sins. And the Spirit loved the Father and the Son so much, and you, that He was willing to be sent into the world to make you alive by uniting Himself to your soul, by working faith and repentance in your heart so that you might become God's sons and daughters in more than just name only, but also in your character, in your nature, that you would become like them. Now the Father, as I've said, paid the price to redeem your soul. He gave what was most precious to him. The Son was that price that he paid. Jesus came and laid down his life. And the Spirit is what the Son purchased so that you would not die in your sins, but you would live. Now that's the part I told you Jonathan Edwards points out that reminds us that each person of the Trinity deserves this glory and this honor because they are all intricately involved. The Father chooses, the Son, or he pays the price, the Son, or I should say the Father gives the price, Jesus pays the price, and we often look at the Spirit as simply applying what Jesus paid. But the Spirit of God is what Jesus purchased, and that makes him equally precious in this work of redemption. And so the question we need to ask is this, what do you owe God for this work? Well, you owe him everything. You owe him your whole heart and your whole life and everything that belongs to you. Uh, Jesus says to you in Mark 12, verse 30, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. You see, that engages every aspect of your being. It is to be (coughs) focused on God. You are to love him with all that you have and all that you are. Now that, by the way, has always been the greatest commandment in Scripture. When Jesus pointed it out, that didn't make it that way to begin with. It's always been. He says this is the sum of everything the law and the prophets had to say. It was what was behind every commandment that God ever gave and everything that he had to do. The sum of everything. But here's the point. You see, before God did his work of redemption, you know, before he did what we've just looked at, you could not do this. But now you can if he has redeemed you. Remember, God gave his son to purchase his spirit so that he might give his spirit to you so that you could do this. And now that you can, this is what he wants you to do. This is what he calls you to do. Now, loving God in this way, as I mentioned before, is more than just, you know, having warm thoughts about him, speaking, even just speaking respectfully about him. Sometimes we think of it as like, you know, when I hear the name of God, I hear the name of Jesus, my heart feels warm and fuzzy. And that's what it means to love him in this way. But that's that's maybe a small part of it, but not but not the totality. It means more than just having warm thoughts. It means more than just meeting with him, you know, and with others who love him on the Lord's Day to worship him. It means more than just meeting on a Wednesday for a Bible study and prayer. It means giving yourself completely to him and holding nothing back. It means to serve him with all your whole heart and life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. By the way, that love of Christ, what is that? The love we have for Christ, the love he has for us, it's really referring to the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember how Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit? When you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with His love. When you're filled with His love, that love controls you. And when that love controls you, this is what you do. You don't live for yourself any longer. But you live for Him who died and rose again on your behalf. So the Father chose you. Jesus died for you. The Spirit raised you again to life so that you would no longer live for yourself, but that you would live for Him. Now, is that what you're doing? Are you living for him with all that you have? If you're not, why aren't you? Hasn't the Father shown you enough love in giving you his son? Hasn't the son done enough in laying down his life for you to save you from hell? Has the Spirit not given you a clear view, a clear sight of the love that the Father and the Son have for you? Has He not worked this love in your heart? Well, as we saw this morning, if He hasn't, then pray that He would. Because you're never going to be able to give yourself to Him in the way God calls you to unless you have the Spirit of God. You're never going to be able to trust Him. You're never going to be able to repent. You're never going to be able to live the way He calls you to live unless the Spirit's work is going on in your soul. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the Spirit, only those who are in the Spirit can. But if on the other hand he he has done that work in your soul, then consider if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have done so much to earn your love, then love them in the way that they call you to love them. Honor them as your Lord. They have the right to tell you what to do. Listen to them and submit to them. Worship them in the way that they call you to worship them. Use their names reverently. Honor their special day and spend that day with them. Honor your parents. Protect the life of your neighbor. 
Keep yourself and those around you sexually pure. Don't take what does not belong to you. Don't lie about others. Be happy with what the Lord has given to you. That's how he wants you to live. And don't forget this last part. Do everything in your power to bring others into this same relationship that you have with the Lord through the gospel so that they too might honor the three persons of the Godhead who saved them. Certainly this is what the Lord deserves for all that they, the triune, you know, the three persons of the Godhead have done for each one of us. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to bring this home and apply it to us.